I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today. It is such a privilege to get to be with you on the 11th hour. I mean that. This is a privilege that God would use us in such a way to talk about the future, to talk about his plans, to talk about what he has for you, not only just for nations, but for you. That's an amazing thing to me. God has a plan for every single person listening. There's someone watching me right now that you thought, I don't have, I, I don't even think I have a purpose. I don't think I have a plan. I don't think there's anything like that. For me. Yes, there is. The Lord said he has a destiny and a destination for you. And if you will just, you say, well, I, I try to hear it. I try to know it. I try to do these things, but I don't seem to catch hold of it. But you know, just by simply trying. And staying in the word and say, Lord, here am I today. Use me. And just by flowing along that day, he will get done through you that day what he wanted done. And you won't even realize you've done it until the day is maybe over or another day and something is said. And you say, you know, that was the Lord. He used me that day. He used me. And you'll start to learn his sweet voice. You'll start to learn how good he is. He is absolutely good. You need to settle that in your thinking. God is absolutely good. If he's not absolutely good, then you couldn't absolutely trust him. But he's absolutely good. He knows the plans he has for you. He knows these things. He plans to prosper you, plans to give you an expected end or a future. Plans to give you a future, my friends. Hallelujah. Father, give us eyes to see. And ears to hear today that we can learn your word together as a family. That we can learn your plan together as a family. And I give you praise and honor and glory for it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I want to start over here today. And, and uh, Matthew, let's just go over to the book of Matthew. I think we want to be in chapter... Uh, three. Let me let me look at this and be sure here. Yeah, and look at verse thirteen. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness, or unto all righteousness. He's saying to John, I'm not coming to be baptized for the remission of sin. I'm coming as a sign of my consecration to put everything back right. Everything back right. Did you know that he consecrated that day to do whatever it's going to take? Not only to put nations back on their courses, but to put you back right. Whatever it takes to make you right, he paid the price for that. And he consecrated that day before heaven and earth, all the spirit realm, all the people there, everything. And John, the, the last legitimate high priest of the Old Testament, baptized him, the Lamb of God, that day. Bathed the spotless Lamb, and there was no blemish in him. And he vowed that day before his father to do what it takes unto all righteousness. All righteousness. To put it all right. Not just in nations, but in your life to put it right. You know, you say, well, I don't see any way out. But he is your way out. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so when John heard that, it says, then he suffered him or permitted him. Jesus was baptized. When he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. So when he came up out of the water, the heavens opened all the way through the nether world to the throne of God and the Holy Ghost. I believe that him and his father locked eyes. And the Holy Ghost lighted on him bodily like a dove. And the Father spoke from heaven, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And so that day, he consecrated to put it back right. 
And Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness in chapter 4 to be tempted of the devil, which it wasn't that the Holy Ghost was leading him to be tempted. The word wilderness is a word that means to speak in Hebrew. He went out there to fast and pray, to hear from his Father what it was going to take to put it all right. But he consecrated to do it because he came to do the will of his Father. And you're part of that will. You're part of that. He didn't plan on leaving you out. He didn't plan on leaving you short. He didn't plan on leaving you with nothing. You're not going to come up short in the kingdom. He did what he did to put it all right again. Hallelujah. And when he did, he said he had fasted 40 days and nights. Now, this is how important it was to him to put it right. He went into a 40 day and night fast. He was afterward, he was hungered. He began to be hungry. And when he did, starvation was trying to set in. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, he came to steal his identity. If he could get his identity, he would get his destiny. And in his destiny was everything to make it right for you and me. And if he could get his identity, he could steal that destiny, and you and I wouldn't have had a chance today. And so he, can, he comes to him and he says this, If thou be the Son of God, because that's the last voice that came from heaven that said, This is my beloved Son. That was Jesus' revelation. He's the beloved Son of God. God in the flesh. And he said, If you be the Son of God, then command that these stones be made bread because all of creation will listen to what you say. But if he had done that, he would have been living out of the words that came out of Satan's mouth, not out of God's. And he said, it is, he said, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And that ended that one. So he's still on track with his destiny and yours and mine. Then the devil taketh him up into a holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the, of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Not only saying you don't tempt the Lord thy God, but saying he also is the Lord thy God. He's God in the flesh. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Getting him up into a place and trying to get him to look down on everything else. But Jesus would not relent on his consecration to his father. He wouldn't go back. He wouldn't be lifted up in pride on a high mountain looking down. He wouldn't be lifted up in pride. He came to deliver us. And he said he showed him all the kingdoms of the world, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, the kingdom of man, the kingdom of angels, the kingdom of man, and the glory of them. And he said unto them, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, or take the lower position. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, and he departed into Galilee, and, having, uh, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt at, in Capernaum, which is on the seacoast and the borders of Zebulun and Nephtali. And Nephtali. Then it, that it may be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Nephtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, to the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and the shadow of death, light is sprung up. So what it is, is that he came to those that were in darkness that had no hope. And he consecrated that day to do it. That's why he never backed out. 
He never drew back. He finished his course, his destiny, so that you could have yours. And I was just led to tell you that today, that you still have a future. You still have a destiny. And so embrace it. Grab hold of it. Destiny is a place of destination. Destiny includes a destination. If destiny can be detoured, there's another destiny other than the one God planned for you, and that is where you'll end up. See, this predestination that some people are just born, there's been people actually teach their children, you were born in this earth to go to heaven and you were born to go to hell. You were destined for heaven and you were destined for hell. I know one such people that told that to their twin sons. And the one they said was going to go to heaven ended up being, the, I think, the worst of them. And the one they said was destined to go to hell ended up really loving God, I think. Now, you think of that. It's not, the plan, it's not that it's, you're predestined. Plans are predestined. If you follow a certain path, it's predestined you're going to end up somewhere. But here, destiny is, is a destination. It's a place of destination. If destiny can be detoured to another road or another destiny other than the one God planned for you, then you will end up in another place. You'll end up in another place. So you have to start staying on your place, your destination. Destiny is a future. The air of tomorrow is the place God walks with you. Now, I want you to listen to that. Destiny is future. The air of tomorrow is the place where God walks with you. The air of destiny. God cannot get bogged down in what is present or what he, he refuses to do this. See, he don't get bogged down into what is now. When he walked out in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 1, and he stepped out on the edge of darkness, and that word darkness there means ignorant death. It was nothing but an ignorant death, a quagmire of seed, semen filled. The Bible even calls it piss filled waters. It's talking about where everything in the world before Adam died and everything was floating in this quagmire of death. That was the war of Lucifer. And it imploded the earth. And God stepped out on the edge of darkness and said, light be, let there be light. And there was light. He refused to get into, make his decisions according to what he's seeing in, in the present at that moment. He began to speak destiny. And he spoke out into that darkness and said, light be. And light was. Now what is that saying? He took command of it with his word. He took command of it with his word, and you're going to take command of your future with his word. You're going to have to take command of what you see present. Well, it's dark right now, Brother Robin. This is a dark time. There's just a, it feels like I'm just in a quagmire of death. Yes, but I'm going to tell you something. When that's the perfect time for you to go to the Word and say, I will live and not die in the name of Jesus. God has a future for me. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above only and not beneath. And you begin to speak and prophesy His Word into that darkness. And it will make light come again. Hallelujah. Destiny is future. The air of tomorrow is the place God walks with you. God cannot get bogged down in what is present or what it is that he, he refuses to do this if, to get bogged down into what is. The future or tomorrow is a real world to God. It's a real place for him. And he bids you and I to come and walk in it. The future tomorrow is a real place for the Lord. Did you know that the Lord can do amazing things with the day? If you go back to the creation, the six days of creation, you find out that on the seventh day, God uh, finished his work and in it, he rested on the seventh day. And one place says, and on it, he rested. So the day is something that God can sit in 
The day is something God can rest on. The day is something that recognizes God. God was moving toward a finish when he said, light be. Let there be light. He was moving toward the seventh day. He was already on destination. He was looking into the future, moving toward that destination. And when he did, it was a beautiful finish. Hallelujah. He even put into the creation, he, he told the creation by taking the form of a man that if the man should stray, I'll take flesh and die and rise again after three days and nights. He did that. Now, I want you to look at Genesis 3, and we're going to look at verse 8 for just a minute. We're going to take a look at this, and, and I want you to see something here. Genesis 3, verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. You ought to underline that in your Bible, in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Said they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. Now this word cool is the word ruach or wind. Notice today we started off the program with the wind. The Lord wanted the wind. When we come out here and Austin turned on my amps and things. That wind was already present. It was blowing through the, the pedals were set just right that God had expression. And he was, it was just blowing. He told me, he said, leave that wind blowing. And let Roxanne intercede when you start the music. Let her intercede for different things. And I didn't know what all she was interceding for. But he said he wanted her to intercede for, for nations and leaders. Benjamin Netanyahu, Donald Trump, and Vladimir Putin. Oh, you mean God would, would speak to a heathen king? Well, now you need to go back and read the scripture. Even if you call him a heathen, you can see where God would raise up people and put on thrones. God knows what's going on in the world, and you're just guessing. He knows what's going on behind the scenes. He knows the wicked mouthpieces that are discussing your future and your demise or to use you as cattle to pull, to pull their plan through the earth and yoke you like an ox. He knows, their vo he knows their vocabulary. He knows what they're saying. So he, he blew the wind and had the Holy Ghost pray through Roxanne and the Lord gave interpretation of prayer. To these three leaders because they're still the three keys. Now in Genesis 3, 8, and Adam and God would walk together in the cool of the day. This word cool is ruach or it's wind. By resemblance, it means breath. And figuratively, it's life. Now you think about that. Breath, wind, it's animation. It's what animates you and every living thing. It means the prophetic spirit. Adam was walking in his future with God. God was coming by and Adam was walking in his future with God. He was walking with him and God was showing him his future, the prophetic spirit. He was seeing down through time. He was seeing things to come. He was seeing a destiny at the end of the 6,000th year. He was seeing all the way through. He had the sight of God. God had sight to the seventh day when he began or the 7,000th year. And he had sight beyond, of course, but that's what had to do with you and I. And so Adam was to live out those six days to the seventh day. And so God would walk with him in the cool of the day to show him the 7,000th year. Hallelujah. And he would show him that. Adam was walking in his future with God. Now I want you to look at St. John chapter 3, and let's go to this part of the text, and I hope you're getting something out of all this today. I can only hear you by faith out there. St. John chapter 3, you know St. John 3. It has the, the famous verse, verse 16. You know that. 
But I want you to look at verse 8. This is Jesus talking to Nicodemus. Well, it was, yeah, we could start in verse uh, 5 maybe. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Verily, verily, I tell you the truth. Amen. Amen. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit, capital S, is Spirit. That which is born of the Holy Ghost operates in the Spirit. He said, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. And then verse 8, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, truly, truly, amen, amen, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. He said, I told you of earthly things, and you believe not. And he said, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? So he says, the wind blows where it wants to, and you hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it goes. And he says, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Did you know that the word wind there and the word spirit is the same word? It's the same word. And it's the same meaning, wind, the Holy Spirit. Jesus is telling you the way, the perfect way to walk with God is in your future. The perfect way he wants you to walk with God, he says, to walk with, with the Father is in your future. That's the way you do it. You start looking toward your destiny. You start looking at your destiny. And you begin to, to go into your future and into your destiny. That's what you're supposed to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You'll have to do what you need to do here. But your, but your destiny, your destiny is huge. Your future and tomorrow is a place of no sin. The past, the present, and the future. The past is, is shadows of what was. It's stuff that, that you, you can't grasp, you can't hold. Even if it's good, it's, it's gone. It's already past. And if it's bad, why do you want to try to embrace it and, and bring it into your now? The present is so fleeting. The moment I say present, it goes into the past. I said present, now it's not present, it's past. And so is that statement. Now it's past and that too. It goes from past into present, but present is now past. So where did the words come from? They come from the Spirit. What is, what is it talking about? The wind. They come from the world of the Spirit, from the future. You, you, you thought of it before you brought it into the present. You were operating in your future. So start taking the Word of God and reach into your destiny. Whatever promise God gave you in that word is what he means for you to live. Whatever promise he gave you in that word is your tomorrow. So start prophesying your tomorrow. The Lord told me something years ago. This is what he said to me. And I know that today, sound, oh, Brother Robin, this sounds so heavy. You're just, you're just talking about things that don't make any sense. But they do to me. I remember the Lord told me one time, Years and years ago, I was talking about it. I was studying about how he stepped out on the edge of darkness, on the edge of nothing. And it was a world that had been at war and imploded where Lucifer had rebelled. And the Lord spoke these words to me. He said, when he stepped out there, he said, I refuse to live in a world 
that someone else created for me. And that was profound to me. And then he said this, why do you? He said, I refuse to live in a world someone else created for me, so why do you? See, you're probably some of you that are so depressed. And the only reason, I was telling the team before we started today, that the reason depression comes is because someone has hidden your future from you. Someone has pulled up a curtain and blinded you from destiny. And all you can see is where you're standing. All you can see is where you are. And it's enough where you are to create such a depression. Even if it's not so bad where you're standing, if you knew this is as far as you will ever go, and you can't see yourself progressing at all, it will bring a depression into your life that absolutely could drive you to the ground. And so depression comes from your destiny, your future being hidden from you. You have to stop, stop and start saying this. Uh, God knows the plans he has for me. It's plans to prosper me. Plans to give me an expected end and a future. God has a bright future for you and your children and your grandchildren. And it don't include destruction and death. It don't include you being broke. It don't include you always living in a war-torn nation where you have no freedoms. He means to turn and he'll turn the whole world just to get you your destiny. He'll make everything. Joshua fighting an, uh, an unending battle. Joshua fighting a battle he knew he couldn't win because the time was running out. So Joshua didn't say, well, I gave it my best shot. I stood here until I, I don't have any more time to fight. It's getting dark and I can't see the enemy and we'll have to retreat. Joshua just stopped and said, sun stand still. Moon stand still because this is the destiny God gave this nation was to win. Win this fight and possess that land out there. So he looked beyond the fight to his destiny, the promise God had made him. You know, I remember hearing years ago Kim Clement talking about one of the greatest prophets we've known in this world, in our time. He said, and probably any time, but he said these words, he said, he was on an airplane, and it was going down, and it looked like it was not going to make it. And people were screaming and yelling and, and panicking. And he said, I was screaming and panicking with them. He said, and then I heard in my spirit, China and other names of countries and places. And he was prompted to shout it out. So he started yelling it out, China, yelling out different things that was in his spirit. The plane made it safely. You say, why did he do that? Because the Lord reminded him of his destiny and where he promised him he would go. What he promised him he would get to do. And he started yelling out his destination and what God had for him. And there was nothing in the present could crash that plane. So you have to start seeing beyond what has God told you. He told you your children would be saved. He told you you wouldn't be broke all your life in this world. He told you these things. He promised you these things. Stand in the edge of the quagmiric darkness and start yelling your destiny out. Hallelujah. Oh, if we start doing things like that, we start living in our tomorrow. We start living in our future. We start living in the place where our destination is. Hallelujah. And so I don't know how heavy all that is to you. I don't know how, how deep that is to you, but it's true nonetheless. It's all true. Praise God. So we begin to look at, at the, the wind of the Spirit. We walk with God in the cool of the day. God was actually walking with Adam. It really means that Adam would go into a euphoric worship. It means he would go into, and this is one of the literal translations, he would go, in the Hebrew words, he would go into a prophetic worship. And when he did, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you how some of these words add up in Revelation when God would walk with him. He would go into a prophetic worship. Adam would. Could you imagine seeing 
he would be in this worship and him and God would walk in the wind together. And Adam saw all the way to the 7,000th year. And he saw the millennial reign and he saw everything that would, he saw what it was supposed to be. And he would go into a prophetic worship and the God would walk up in the life of the day. His prophetic worship would cause the energy in the earth to come alive. Everything that made the trees live, everything that made the animals, everything that animated it. That's what the word wind is talking about. It was what brought animation and life to all the creation. And Adam's prophetic worship would stir it up to the point that God could walk up in it. He could see him. See his image and walk with him in the garden in the cool of the day in that wind. And Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, do you see the wind? He said, do you know where it's coming from? He said, the wind blows where it wants to. And you hear the sound, but you can't tell where it comes from and you can't tell where it's going. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit. And the word Spirit in capital S here is the same word for wind. He's talking about, he said, you, here you are at this place. God is wanting to restore man back to the euphoric prophetic worship so that the air could actually live around him and that he could come and walk with you. And Nicodemus said, how can these things be? He said, you're a, you're a master in Israel and you don't know this? He said, I can't tell, I tell you of of." of earthly things and you can't believe it. How am I going to tell you about these, this heavenly thing? So you and I, Jesus did what it took to make it all right. You may be in this world, but you're not of this world. And you can start going into this worship. And you can start saying, Lord, I worship according to my destiny. I praise you according to my destiny. Not according to what I see right now. I, I praise you according to what you've told me will be. I praise you according to the plan you've given me and my family. I praise you for that, Lord. And I praise you in that. And I'm going to tell you something. It will carry you right over that... <laughs> like a bridge over troubled waters. It will carry you right over that troubled sea. Now, do you know why Jesus went to sleep in the back of that boat? He laid down and, slip, and slept until the water, the Bible says the boat was full of water. It was full of water. Well, tell me how he was sleeping if it was full of water. On a pillow. Well, what was he doing? Walking on the water in his sleep. Because you know what he had said? Let us go to the other side. He was always looking at the other side. I'm going to my destiny. Let's go over there. And there's not a storm or a devil big enough to keep me out of it. So he just went to sleep. And so they said, don't you care that we perish? It's obvious you're not going to die. Here you are sleeping on the top of the water. And he got up and dealt with that storm. Peace, be still. Shut up and be still. Shut up, yes. Quit saying things contrary to what I'm called to do. Just be still. And there was a great calm. And it scared those men worse than the storm. So he goes over and delivers the, the Gadarene demoniac and so forth. So I wanted you to hear today. I wanted you to hear in this 11th hour about these things. Start worshiping according to your destiny, not according to what you see. There's nothing in this present time big enough to keep you out of that world. Because what you can see, you can enter. And tomorrow's a real world to God. It's a real world to Him. And if you dare live in it with Him, it can be your reality. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. People will look at you. Yes, they will. They'll look at you and say, you're so strange acting. Why? Because you won't operate in fear like they're doing. You won't stand in the present and say, ah, I don't know what to do. I'm so afraid. You're living according to tomorrow. And so today has to be ordered to get you there. Oh, man, that's, a, that's something somebody ought to hear. 
Oh, you ought to hear that. I mean, I, I, you know. But Brother Robin, I thought you was going to come on here and talk about uh, all these nations and things. Well, maybe I am. But if you start living in your tomorrow, you know what happens? You start looking at, at your destiny, and the present day is ordered to get you there. It's ordered to get you there. The storm kicked up. Well, where did that storm come from that tried to sink the boat? The storm came from those legion of demons that were in that madman. They came out there to meet him in the middle of the water. Maybe sometime I'll do a teaching on Galilee and you'll know why they were there. But he came out there in the middle of the water to stop the Son of God. But the water held him up. And he just slept on the top of the water because the day had been ordered to get him to the other side. And he told all the men, let us go. And if they had arrested in him and said, you know, we're just going to go to sleep too. Ain't nothing we can do about this. We're just going to go to sleep too. And maybe they would have looked up and said, yeah, just shut up and be still. We're going to rest with him. Somehow, miraculously, that boat would have found its way to the other side. Now, how do I know that? Because when he came to them walking across the water, there is one scripture that says when he got to the boat and stepped in the boat, immediately it was to the other side. The day was ordered to get him there. When Kim began to speak out the nations he was going to go to, it ordered that plane to get him there. Even if the plane wasn't flying to China, it had to land him safely so he could get on another one. So if you start, if you start living and worshiping according to your destiny, the day, the life of the life of the day is ordered for you to walk with God right into it. That's what it was coming for. That's why he came up in the life of the day. Adam was worshiping in the Ruach. In the future, in the Holy Ghost, he was working, uh, worshiping for his destiny. He was seeing all the way through his time of his lease on the earth, 6,000 years. He was looking at it. He was seeing through the prophetic windows of time. and He would worship according to that. And the life of the day would be charged and come up. And what animated the whole day began to come alive and so strong that God would walk up in it and say, walk with me, Adam, to your destiny. So if you begin to worship today, not according to what you see, but according to what is going to be and what he promised, the day will be ordered to carry you there. Hallelujah. So maybe we got that part said. So when we, you hear prophets start prophesying, the rightful president, Donald J. Trump, that's who heaven recognizes as the president. 2020 won't go away. It won't go away. Why won't it go away, Brother Robin? Because it's in the wind. It was destiny. And destiny, was a storm kicked up to try to stop it. But it won't go away. And it'll never go away until it's fixed. And so prophets keep prophesying what they saw. How can we say but, but what we've seen and what we've heard? I can't say any more than that. No matter what it may be. No matter what it may be. When I speak that government entities and, and, and speak about, when I spoke about the state and I talked about two adulterous affairs and all of this and, and all of that in the Supreme Court of, of, of this state and so forth, I, I said, fix it. Just fix it. I don't know who. I don't know what. I just heard it. So what do I do? Not say it. Well, God forbid. I will say it. I will say it. What is my staff in this one ring? Some of you remember the vision I saw. 
And the staff is to remain there and hold that place. That represents prophets. There are things going on, and, and if you start to look, you'll see the trial of righteousness is own in the United States. It's own in the world, the trial of righteousness. Some of you heard me talk about that. Did I mention that Sunday? Did I say something about that Sunday, the trial of righteousness? And he said, you be sure you don't let it into your family circles. In other words, keep your family circles right because the trial of righteousness now is in the earth and things are being tried. Things are being weighed in the balance. You saw the other day when Mitch McConnell just froze and nobody can figure out to this day why. They try to say this, they try to say that, but look at the concern on the people's face around him. They were very concerned. Why won't this thing with Hunter Biden go away? Because it's in the trial of righteousness right now. And listen to me close. Every government entity, Supreme Courts, whether they be statewide, nationwide, makes no difference. Even what's be equivalent to the local governments. If every decision you make right now is being weighed in the balance. The trial of righteousness is happening now. See, it's the time of the lions. It's the time of the lion. Some of you remember when the Lord told us that. It's at the time of the lion. Well, the time of the lion. Well, in the time of the lion, everybody has their time with the lions. Krista had an awesome revelation about Daniel and the lion's den. Maybe she'll tell you about that sometime. But let me tell you something ab about the time, your time with the lions. You're either going to be a Daniel that they're trying to put you in the lion's den. And that, I'm speaking to prophets. But the Lord will shut the mouth of the lions. Or you're going to be those who, who tried to frame Daniel and put him in that lion's den. They had their time with the lions, but it affected their whole families. It affected their whole families. Every one of their them, their wives, their children, everything was destroyed. The lions in their time, the lions break their bones before they could hit the ground. So in the time of the lion, the lion comes through the land. This is the trial of righteousness. Government entities have gotten arrogant until they fill the room with their odor and choke the, the, the breath out of normal people because they think they're gods. But you're not God. You're not even close. You only have an image of him. And most of you, a lot of you, may not even be able to reveal him. See, everybody, everybody is supposed to be able to reveal God and reflect God. Only those born again serving him can reveal him. Those that are not born again can only reflect him like a stagnant water uh, mud puddle. You can see a reflection in it. The sun can even hit it and make it look beautiful, but it's just stagnant water. But those that are living for God can not only reflect him, but reveal him to you. And so here... We are in this time of righteousness. And governments have, and, and I'm talking about local all the way to the highest. I'm not just talking about one sector. And I'm not just talking about one or two people. There are people that, that governments and courts think they have on trial and they don't realize they're being tried by heaven. And however they treat them, is how they're judged. And don't think that God can't replace every one of you. He can replace every judge known by next week. He could replace every governor, every leader, every mayor in a week, in a day. The book is full of things like that. How he did things in a day. 
Remember when there was a shortage? We don't remember, but you read it in Elisha's day. And that's the time we're in, the time of Elisha, the time of the double. That's why you hear prophets, uh, you know, people say, well, you're, you're, you're John the Baptist. No, I'm not. I may speak and sound like him a lot with that kind of prophecy, but that, that's not, I actually walk in an anointing like Elisha, similar to that. There's already been an Elisha and a, and a Elijah and a John. But there's anointings that resemble that. And Elisha spoke like Elijah, and he spoke like Elisha. And so that's what you're seeing. You're seeing these anointings and the boldness of Elijah or John the Baptist is being spoke. That's what, that's what people are hearing. And then you hear Elisha, that kind of anointing. And you'll hear the Samuel anointing. And you'll hear David's anointing. And you'll hear Jeremiah's anointing. You'll hear these sounds. That's why they looked at Jesus and said, when he said, who do men say that I the son of man am? Well, some say you're John the Baptist, risen from the dead. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're one of the prophets, Jeremiah. One of the, why? Because he, he spoke bold like Elijah. He, he's, he wept like Jeremiah. He, he did these things. But right now, I'm really needing you to hear this especially if you're a politician and especially if you're a judge. Whether you're a local probate judge all the way up to Supreme Court justices, every decision being made is being weighed. Oh, now you've got to hear this. Because the enemy has kicked up a storm to keep my America the Lord says, from its destination. There's been a storm brought upon the seas of nations to keep my Israel from its destination. There's a storm swelled up within the waters of the nations and the seas of the world. I speak of nations to keep men and women that I made a promise to, says the Lord to bring them to their destination. There's been an occurrence of filth, an occurrence of immorality, and the swelling of legalities, legislating lies, to keep my people from the other side. So I have come to see if the cry is as great as I've heard, says the Lord. And so now it will be weighed in the balance. Judges make right judgments. Attorneys and lawyers, clean your act up. Clean your ass up for too many asses, donkeys, are influencing your words. The world is not created according to the mouth of an ass. The governments are not established according to the braying of a midnight donkey. The governments are established on righteousness and the word of God. So clean your ass up. Clean it up. And speak the truth. So that justice and righteousness may reign. Because there is a destination for you also and a destination of greatness for the politicians I called to be in the place of government. There is a destination 
and the swelling of the storm in the sea has come to stop it from being. But nay, it will not stop it, for I will have my say before you are called away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Now, can you hear the love and the authority in warnings? For God wants all to meet their destination and to go into their destinies. But seas and storms come to stop it. But behold, says the Lord, my people are learning to rest in me. They're learning to rest in me knowing I will get the ship safely to the other side. So hear the word of the Lord. Peace, be still. Shut up winds and waves. Be still. And there is a great calm. Hallelujah. My goodness. My goodness. You know, when things get, they swell to the point they're dangerous. Not just for nations and, and groups of people, but when they swell to the point that they're dangerous in keeping everyone from their destinies. You know, a global reset and a global one world government is only to do one thing. Change your course of destiny to the course of of the destiny they want to create. That's all that's about. Satan wants to yoke mankind like an ox and use, use a lesser being using the image of God to plow his furrows through the earth. This is not to be. This is not to be. It will only really take place in, for seven years at a certain time when the prophets end their testimony that will begin foreshadowing what will come in Revelation 11. But then there's really only three and a half years where there's any real authority to be seen. So this is not, and that's only because the seed of the serpent was planted eons ago. But the heel of the woman's seed will surely bruise his head. Amen. So today, go ahead and worship in your prophetic euphoric worship. And worship according to your destiny. Worship, if you don't know what your personal destiny, exactly what God wants you to do, there are promises in this book right here that promises you a future to give you an expected end. Every blessing in it is for you. Every single one of them is yours. Well, you say, well, some of them's for Israel. Yeah, but you've been grafted in. So the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That entitles you to them all. All. And he said, thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Now you know why he said all. He, he meant to get it back to everybody. Make it available to you all. Hallelujah. Man, I could just keep going, but I think it's time to, to hand you the mic and and let the Lord just begin to minister in prosperity and show the people how to prosper. And, and uh, you know, hallelujah. Well, you just take the mic. <laughs> Praise God. Well, we want to thank you all for tuning in today. Of course, we, we never take this time for granted. We, we always enjoy our time with our 11th hour family on the other side of that camera. No matter where you are watching from today, there is no distance in the Spirit. And there's no distance in God. He, if you are a believer, then He is where you are. Whether that's at the bottom of the world and we're at the top. We're all together. Amen. Amen. Well, as you're preparing your offering today, and uh, you can give by going to robindbullock.com, and the ways to give are also on the screen. You know, this this morning when I was um, I was playing drums, and I had this I had this 
I, I guess you would call it a, a vision, but just this flash of, of something. And I saw this, I saw this person. Now, there is this meme from, a, um, from one of the Lord of the Rings movies. And I've never seen this particular one, but it's, it is, I, I think it's in the story. It's not in the trilogy, but it's something related to it. But anyways, we're not talking about the movie. We're talking about the meme. And this guy, and he's got these bags, and he's in mid-run, and he's just running. And he's got this smile on his face, and it's always about going on an adventure. And I saw somebody running just like that just running uphill or running wherever as fast as they possibly could, just taking seeds and, and throwing them, and just taking seeds and throwing them. And it's not a good thing that I saw. There, people are carelessly sowing seeds. They're just carelessly sowing them. And they're just running with a smile on their face. You know, the pastor at Church International talked about a few weeks ago about having staying power. Being planted somewhere. Being planted. Now, we're talking about seed, right? We're being planted. Staying where God has for you to be. So you take this, you take this person, and just this is nobody in particular. This is just a made-up person in my head, but this pertains. If the shoe fits for you, listen. But they're they're called to this ministry. I am here. Now I'm not talking about just this ministry. Ministries all over. I'm called here. This is where God wants me to be. I know it. I know it. The minute somebody comes up to you and says, I'm not going anywhere, go ahead and shake their hand and say, it was so nice knowing you. <laughs> because they're already on their way out. But they come in, you know, as we say, guns blazing. And they're ready. They're ready to do whatever they want to do. They come in on fire. They're, they're ready to serve, whatever. How can I serve? How can I serve? How can I get in and serve? Well, you got to wait six months. Okay, well, I'll wait my six months. I'll, I'll get in there and I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll be here. Uh, as, as I live and breathe, I will not leave you. And all this. And it's just scripture after scripture. And they're, they're planted. And they're, the whole time, now that may be... They're, they may have no other motive in their heart but what they are saying at that moment. And so while they're here, and I'm just using this ministry as an example because I'm a part of this one. While they're here, they're sowing, they're sowing seeds. They're sowing seeds of faithfulness. They're sowing seeds of, of, being, of being strong. They're, they're sowing seeds that eventually will move them, they will see progress in their life. They'll just keep going up, keep going up. Go from this volunteer position to this volunteer position to this volunteer position and just keep moving up. God places them, He gives them promotion, all of this stuff. And then, out of nowhere, here comes a wild hare. I've got to go. I've got to go. Bye. What happened to the seeds, all those seeds you just planted? What happened to those? And you just go place after place after place after place, sowing seeds. You spent your time taking care of that particular seed, cultivating that seed. And you just go in place to place to place, and then you wonder why you're not prospering. You never got to see it grow. You never stayed long enough in one place to see it grow because all of a sudden uh, you just get this, this thought that I've got to go. I've got to leave. You say, how does this pertain to the offering? Because you're never going to prosper in any aspect of your life if you cannot sit still. Sit still, stand still. 
You ever see people in church? You ever see people in church sit sit in during service? And then all of a sudden, you could almost count down the second. They got to get up and go to the bathroom. They, they cannot sit still. It's, it's a habit. They have formed a habit. They have formed a habit. It's a cycle in their life. That there are some people that could not stay past 12 o'clock in a church service if you glued their butt to the seat. That they, they would. They just get they get up like mama. And, and I'm not making fun of my grandmother. That's a joke with her. We laugh about that. They would just get up and, and take the seat with them. They cannot stay past a certain time. There are some people who cannot stay put where God has them to be if their life depended on it, and it does. Your life depends on your faithfulness where God has you placed. Your life depends on it. And so does your family's life. Prospering spiritually, physically, and financially. You, know, you said something, and I was going to wait, and the Lord said, go say it. You know, if somebody looks at you and says, as I live and breathe, I will not leave you. Mm. And they are that sure that God called them there. Oh. Or wherever that may be. As you say, as I live and breathe, I will not leave thee. And then you lead thee. Then you have vowed your life and breath on that. Oh, dear God. And so the thing to do is when you, if you're not sure of something, Say, as the Lord lives right. and guides me on what to do, right. I will obey him. Yeah, that's right. But you start saying this stuff as I, as I live and breathe, I won't leave. You have bet your life and breath and laid it on the line. Yeah. And then you leave. And as soon as, have you ever noticed when people leave where they were supposed to be, then all of a sudden you don't think the same anymore. Right. That's right. You don't think the same anymore. No, you don't. You, you've got to be in a place and stay. Yes. And you've got to be there. And, and cycles come around ever so often to make people get up and, and run. Mm -hmm. But once you leave that place, God may have had you there, think about this, to correct right. that one thing that would fix your life forever. Yeah. Then he might have gave you liberty to go. Yeah. But if you won't stay and you wouldn't receive that correction, yeah. and then you go, you carried your problem with you, yeah. and it will catch you down the road somewhere. So anyway, I, I, I need to say that. To yeah. you. That anointing grew when you were talking. It got, it had to be said. And then the Lord showed me this. And see, some people... They said, well, why that all those seeds that I planted, I never saw, I never saw the harvest for it. I never saw the harvest for it. Now the Lord showed me this. When you ran off and left your garden that you took time building in this one place, it grew up. Because the scripture says, and I'm about to get to it, God is not mocked. He set a system in motion that whatever seed is planted, He will give life to it. It's the government of God. This unseen power comes and gives life to that seed. You planted it, you took care of it, you cultivated it, all this, and then all of a sudden you ran off. Well, what if that seed has just grown up and it's a beautiful plant? And somebody walks up right behind you in the place that you were supposed to be and looks around, goes to the house that the garden belongs to, knocks on the door. Is this your... But nobody answers. It's an abandoned home. It's an abandoned garden. And they just say, this is my garden now. 
and they take your harvest that you spent that time sowing and they step into that role. Because, yeah, you will reap where you haven't sown. Is that what you just said? Mom just said that. And then you think, where? Wh why didn't I ever see that? You ran off and left it. You just ran off and left it. And then God needed somebody over that garden. He needed somebody in that role, in that position. You abandoned your post. And God said, well, here you go. And we know that that's true because we're, we're living right now, the body of Christ, all of us, we're living in seeds that other ministers have sown in the past. And we are reaping what they sowed. They may never saw it, not because they ran off and left it. That was their job to continue, and we're walking in it. Your children walk in seeds that you've sown. But what if somebody is planting seeds in their life spiritually, physically, financially, whatever, and then they just take off and, and run because they can't sit still. And then somebody else just comes along and says, well, there's nobody here, and they're not taking it illegally because you abandoned it. it you literally gave it back. Stay right here. I guess this mic is all right to use, huh? Yes. You know, here is the thing. Uh, I thought about this, too. And I should have said this a while ago, that when, when somebody comes and the Lord will bring you to a place, now whether it's here, whether, where, right. wherever it is, but he'll bring you to a place and, and there could be a correction mm -hmm. that he has to make mm -hmm. in order to get you to your destiny. Mm -hmm. You can't receive that correction because it goes against the way you've been doing things. Mm -hmm. So you get upset and you don't receive the correction. If you leave your post before it's done, have you ever noticed something, your mindset changes? Yeah, it does. It does. Your mindset changes. Yeah. Your whole mind will change and you will talk different. Yeah. You'll talk different. Now, let me show you what I mean. You, while you were there trying to, there's people that's come here. Because uh, I can speak for this because I know this ministry. I don't know everybody else's. Right. But there's people that come and, oh, yeah, I'm here. As you're, you know, this is where I'm, I'm forever. I belong here. This is my first. Oh, I feel like I'm family, this, that. And, and they were doing good. And, right. and the Lord was using them and trying to correct something maybe, trying to shape them into something that he was going to launch them on something. I don't right. know. I don't know what it might have been. But here's the thing. They leave too early. The first thing they do is badmouth you. Yeah, yeah. Their mind changes. Yeah. See, your mind will change. You're no longer, you're angry because you couldn't stick it out. Right, right. And then so you start badmouthing the ministry you left, but that you were praising two weeks ago. Right. And so what happens? You abandon your place where you were planted, and your mind changes. Yeah. Because you had a mentality to think there. Yeah. And now you're somewhere else thinking there. Yeah. And you're thinking always, it always ends up hurling insults if it's done that way. Yeah. Now, I thought about you take people like Brother Jerry Savell. Mm -hmm. When he was called into his own ministry, he didn't want to leave Brother Copeland. <laughs> <laughs> that was a different story. Right. He just didn't want to go. And but the Lord knew that now you've learned, you've shaped, everything's right. Mm -hmm. So go ahead, and now it's time. And, and when he went up to Brother Copeland, Brother Copeland looked at him and said, when are you leaving? He said, the Lord has called you into your own thing. Yeah. And then the Lord told him, said, y'all will never quit preaching together. Right. Now see, and the mindset never changed. And they haven't. Never have they quit. They're preaching together this week. Yeah, <laughs> and it's all, but the mindset stayed the same. Yeah. God was trying. How many people do you think, Krista, he was trying to bring up in a mindset right? like that ministry? Yeah. And he wanted them, he needed them to be able to do what that ministry does. Yeah. He needed them as key puzzle pieces That's right. to, to join as a, as a family to make that ministry take that word God had given it to the ends of the earth. Yeah. 
but they leave too early. That's right. And their mind changes. Yeah. And they join uh, places that don't like them. Mm -hmm. And they immediately join their voices with them. And two weeks ago, it was the opposite voice. Yeah. So what happens? You abandon your place. You leave your harvest. You leave all your prosperity that God had had you sow for. And just when it all came up and the Lord was going to hand you the keys to that house, right. the harvest cries for you. And you're in another you're place. You can't even hear it anymore. And so how many harvests do you think is laying around? Right. And somebody say, well, you know, they just walked into that ministry and just flourished. They may have walked into someone right. else's exactly. garden. Exactly. And um, so anyway, as I hear things, I come no, back. No, I'm glad you do. <laughs> iron sharpens iron. Yeah. But in Galatians, you said, Kristen, do you have a scripture for us today? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Galatians 6, 4. And we're going to start there. This is the message translation. It says, make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you have been given. And then sink yourself into that. Amen. Sink yourself into that. Don't be impressed with yourself. Don't compare yourself with others. It says, each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your own life. And then in verse 6, it says, be very sure now, you who have been trained to a self-sufficient maturity, that you enter into a generous common life with those who have trained you. Those who have trained you sharing all the good things that you haven't experienced. That's what you were just talking That's about. Right. That you share in a generous common life. Yep. That they're both ministering together. That's yep. their common life. Yep. And they share what God has done with each other or to with each other's ministries with each other. Well, then it goes on to say this. One of my favorites. Don't be misled. No one makes a fool of God. What a person plants, he will harvest. The person who plants selfishness, ignoring the needs of others, ignoring God, harvests a crop of weeds. And he'll have to show for, and all he'll have to show for his life is weeds. But the one who plants in response to God, letting God's Spirit do the growth work in him, harvest a crop of real life, eternal life. And then it goes on to the scripture, let us not grow weary in well-doing. So, and that's the one we all shout about in Galatians. Hallelujah, for in due time we will reap if we faint not. Go back and read, read the top part of that. Go back a few verses. It says God will not be made a fool of. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. You sow seeds of selfishness, you grow a crop of weeds. Guess what hides in weeds? Snakes. Yeah, they do. Snakes hide Snakes in weeds. Hide I'll in never weeds. forget when we were going to pick out our wedding spot. Nobody had cut the grass yet, and everybody was just walking out there. I walked out there like this. <laughs> I was like, because it was weeds, weeds everywhere, and I know what hides in weeds. And guess what? You go around just carelessly sowing selfishness, talking about others, whatever, this and that. You're growing up weeds everywhere you go. Your grass ain't never going to look good. Landscaping can't help it. It's all weeds everywhere. And then you wonder, why do all these people who manipulate, they're backbiting, they're liars and all this, always show up in my life because everywhere you go you're walking in weeds and snakes hide in them and they will show up oh yeah so my brother and sister this is not just pertaining to money you know you want to talk about money since it is the offering if you're at a normal job just a regular job you know you actually have to stay in a place for long enough to start reaping the benefits financially yes 
You do. You have to stay at a job long enough. Now, that is in this world, this natural world. You have to stay. You, you set up retirement, different things like that. You have to stay at a place long enough to be eligible yes. to receive those things. Yes. You leave early, you don't get them. That's right. And so, in the system of God where yeah. he has called you to be, stay there. Because just like the pastor said a couple of Sundays ago, get where you belong and stay there because there lies your prosperity yes. and there lies your protection. Yes. And that's prosperity and protection spiritually, physically, and financially. And that is what God wanted me to tell you today. Quit running around sowing seeds carelessly and then come to him complaining why you've never seen a harvest in your life. But all these other people around me are blessed. All these other people around me, how long they've been at this church? I've been here three weeks and I ain't got to do nothing. And they get to do everything. They've been here for 25 years. <laughs> That's the truth. And they're prospering. Yes. And if God leads them to start their own ministry or something like that, everybody around them will know it. And my brother and sister, when that happens, and I'm, I'm, I'm closing with this, when that happens, and if God does call you somewhere else, have integrity and do it the right way. Do it the right way because you have just sown discord among the brethren. When you leave without integrity, you leave without being honest. And then you start trying to cover up everything that you did because you think that it, it wasn't going to be as easy just to go to the pastor or go to somebody and tell them, go to a leader, a person in authority, and tell them and explain to them what God has shown you and get them to pray with you. Instead, you leave and you start running everybody down and you light a match and you walk away and you're not hurting them. You're hurting yourself. And that's for everybody watching and all of us here in this yes, room. Yes, true. You are only hurting yourself because you are sowing seeds constantly. And one day, my friends, that will catch up with you, with me, with all of us. Because God is not mocked. So today, where God has called you, plant your feet. Plant them. Sink yourself into it, like it said. Sink yourself into it. Be mature. Work hard. Be faithful. And watch your life grow. It is time the body of Christ absolutely start prospering because we've got a job to do and yeah. we've got places to go and people to see delivered and set free and take with us because there are world changers out there waiting on the other side of your obedience. And so today we need to make a consecrated, firm decision that we will stay put in what God has for us to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. I know I, I went around the world to say that, but, but the, the Lord has really, Galatians has become my book right now. And I'm, I'm here for it. I am. But right now we're going to go back to Luke. 638 where it says give and it shall be given unto you good measure pressed down shaken together and running over shall men give unto your bosom for with the same measure that you meet with all it shall be measured to you again you say I believe it I receive it I call it done in Jesus name now we're going to jump to Malachi 310 where it says bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith saith the Lord of hosts if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field saith the Lord of hosts and all nations shall call you blessed 
for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. I believe it, I receive it, I call it done in Jesus' name. Amen, so be it, praise God. Roxanne, bring us some encouragement today, amen. Yes, hallelujah, I'm here for it. <laughs> that made me laugh. We are here for it. We're here to encourage you today as well. Thank you so much for sending in your praise reports. Uh, we read some this week. You know, we laugh, we cry, it moves us. So <laughs> we have a few this week I wanted to share with you guys. This one actually came through, I think, on the chat, and it said, uh, Testimony. My body was aching for about a month, and Prophet Robin was on the program and said, Dance, and the pain will go away. Everything hurt, yet I obeyed, and the pain went away forever. Glory to God. You know, it's a big deal when you've been in pain for so long, and then all of a sudden, you're not in pain anymore. You will run around the parking lot. You'll run around your town shouting hallelujah. So we rejoice with you today. Also, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to condense this just a little bit, um, a precious partner from Texas wrote in and said, uh, some years ago, 2013, around that time, um, I wanted to stop going to doctors and depend on God alone, and over time, I did so. So here's a recent testimony of perfect healing. Uh, she says, on June 21st, I was sitting at the dining room table for a moment while cooking a meal. I was noticing difficulty seeing clearly, and I remembered in God's word when Jesus healed the blind man's eyes. I had my fingers on my closed left eyelid, and I said to the Lord, you healed the blind man's vision. Heal my left eye with the astigmatism. And, the Lord, and Lord, I want better than 20-20 vision. So at that moment, I felt within my eyeball something move and stop. I opened my eyes, and I could see perfectly out of my left eye, far distance and near. I even went outside and looked around and could see everything perfectly better than even in my childhood. I couldn't wear my glasses as they made everything blurry. And she says, over the next few days, I still had blurry vision in my right eye. And... Let me turn my page real quick. Pages are sticking together. Come on, come on. All right. I still had blurry vision in my right eye, and I was favoring now my healed left eye. So on the 26th, I sat down at the dining room table again while cooking a meal. Remember, Jesus had healed the blind man's eyes. And for a second time, I laid my two fingers on my right eyelid, and I told the Lord, you healed the blind man's eyes. Heal my right eye totally and completely to better than 20-20 vision. I finished praying, opened my eyes, and Jesus had healed my right eye perfectly. I can see just fine, perfectly far and near now in both eyes. It's taken me several days to get used to it and not wearing glasses, as I always put them on first thing in the morning. She said, but maybe in a week or, week or so I'll be able to do that. She said, everything is very clear and all the colors are vibrant. I can see better than perfect. I drive without glasses now and do everything without them. It's so amazing, wonderful Jesus' healing and love in my life. All praise to our Lord Jesus, G-I-A-G. So hallelujah. hallelujah. That's amazing. You know, when you when you get the blurry vision as you get older, you you know, that's a big deal when you can see better than you did as a child. So praise God. We praise the Lord for her perfect vision and the Lord healing her. So please keep uh, sending your praise reports in. Send them on robindbullock.com. Scroll down, click the contact prayer request form, and you'll be able to scroll there and enter your praise reports so that we can rejoice with you. We can share them on the 11th hour so that we can raise everybody's faith and victory through the word. So we thank you so much for sending those in, and we will read them again next week. Amen. Well, praise God. That was all encouraging, wasn't it? I mean, from the offering all the way to the praise uh, reports, everything was so awesome. I want you to know that, that um, you are our partners, and uh, I want you to know that I love you. I pray for you. I was praying over you last night. I'll be praying over you again tonight uh, or today as the Lord impresses me what time. But you're never a day without prayer. You always have prayer. Um, and don't forget that. That um, I carry your names with me so I can hold you in my hand like that and pray over you. <clears throat> I have certain scriptures that I pray over you. And scriptures that cover healing, uh, wisdom, uh, the eyes of your understanding, um, finances, all these things. 
and so I pray over you, and I have been for a long time now. Amen. So, uh, it's been a good 11th hour today, hasn't it? Well, I want you to, to know this, never forget this. We'll gather together around God's Word again. You know, I don't know that if we stopped and took the time, to, but we're going to right now. If you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you know, that's the most important thing you could ever do. You will never do anything more important than that. You know, why would you work so hard to prepare for next week and not prepare for eternity to come? That just don't make real good sense to me. You know, I remember a little story. In a, I remember it was a Jack Chick track when I was a kid growing up in, the, in a missionary Baptist church. I was just a little boy. And Jack Chick had this track, and it was called The Fool. And, and the king and, and this little court jester was who they called The Fool. And he would come up and make the king laugh and do all this. And in this little comic, the king handed him something and said, I want you to search the kingdom. And when you find a bigger fool than you, give him this, this wand or this thing, whatever it was he gave him. So he went through the kingdom and couldn't find anybody, and he came back, and the king was dying, and he looked at the king, and he said, and the king said, little, little fellow, I'm about to take a journey that I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not prepared to take. He said, you mean you're, you're, you're not prepared for what's about to happen? The king said, no. He said, then I must present you with this. He had found a bigger fool than himself. So what you want to do is don't let the devil brand you and, and as a fool or anything. You make Jesus the Lord of your life. It's not Hare Krishna that is a savior. Are you kidding? It's not Buddha, Mohammed, or anyone else. It's only Jesus. See, Jesus is not, you know, one spoke in, many, in a wheel of many spokes that leads to one center. That's, that's crap. Jesus is the center. He's everything. He's the wheel. He's it all. He didn't say, I am a way, I am a truth, and I am a lie. He was the only one of all those people, every religious leader that's ever been, he's the one that said, I am the only way the only truth, and the only life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Now, that's a bold statement. And, and I'm going to tell you something. He meant it when he said it too. And he died on the cross and stepped in and paid the price for you and I. He died for us so that we wouldn't have to. He went into hell so we wouldn't have to go there. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. He, he was in the pits of the dam for three days and nights, paid the ultimate price for Adam's treason, rose again, and he ascended to the right hand of God the Father, and he's the only way. Paul said, how do you, to be saved, if you ask, how do you be saved? Paul said, believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Confess with your mouth that he's your Lord, and you'll be saved. So why don't you do that right now? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord, my King, my personal Savior. Forgive me of all sin. Cleanse me. Make me new again. From this day forward, I belong to you. Take my life and do something with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you've done that, then you just became a child of God. Please let us know. Email us. Tell us uh, what you just prayed. There is a booklet, a free download booklet on the website. And um, it's Jesus, why it is the way it is. You can get that free and it will help you get started on and you know why it's Jesus and no other way. It'd be a good thing to ground yourself in to start with. And I'll tell you something. And when you do that, if you can't say, well, I can't download it. Well, you write to us and request that and we'll send it to you absolutely free. It won't cost you anything. Amen. 
Amen. I, I remember when I was staying at, a, at a, what they called a prophet's house, a prophet's quarters out on a lake. I was preaching a, a camp meeting in Vidalia, Georgia. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to write a tract, you know, a booklet telling about Jesus. I said, Lord, what do you want me to write it about? He said, if somebody had never heard of Jesus in their whole life, what would you tell them? Well, I thought it would be simple. But it took me about six weeks to write that little booklet. And I, because I thought, well, I'd just say, well, it's Jesus. Well, why is it Jesus? Well, let's see. It's him. It's, he's the son of God. And then I thought they'd say, well, why is he the son of God? How come Buddha not the son of God? How come Mohammed not the son? Why is he the son of God? Well, then you got to answer that. Well, it's Jesus and his blood. Well, why is it his blood? Well, then you find out real quick. If nobody had ever heard of him, then what would you tell them? And that's what that booklet is. And so you can have it free. Amen. And don't stop at just being born again. Go ahead and get baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Say, Lord Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Ghost. Baptize me in the Holy Spirit and fire. And give me the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And then just start thanking Him for it. And then whatever sounds you hear, just begin to say those sounds. Whatever sounds you hear, just release them out of your mouth. Now you're praying mysteries hidden in God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Then pray that you interpret and God will let you understand what you said. Amen. Well, until next time we gather together right here around God's Word, I want you to remember, never forget that God is absolutely good. Shalom, shalom.